Hello, welcome to the EPG Patshala. This is the course called Introduction to Linguistics and today's unit is called The Nature of Words. It's the first part of two units on morphology. Let's begin with the question, what do speakers of a language know about the words in their language. First, they seem to know which words actually occur in their language and which words do not. Although the words which do not occur can very well occur. They, they don't go against any rules of the language, whether of the sounds, the way sounds are put together and so on. For example, if you speak English, you know that of, what, whether, and the limitations are all words of English. Compare F, E, F. There's nothing wrong with that word, except it doesn't actually occur in English. Or the word what, W, A, T. It's not an occurring word of English. A word like wafer, W-E-A-F-E-R, doesn't occur in English, but there's nothing wrong with it, either by uh, looking at the spelling or looking at the sound. It is a possible word. There is no word unlimited. I can imagine that word. It means to remove a limitation, but it doesn't occur in English. You can take similar examples from Hindi. We know that there are words like ki in English, usne kaha ki, but there's no word ku except as a suffix. Kya is a question word in English, but there's no word ki, which is a question word in Hindi, I'm sorry, Hindi. Mosam is an occurring word in Hindi, masam is not. Asim and simit are words of Hindi, they mean limitless, and limited respectively. But you cannot make a verb out of sima and say simana in Hindi. Although there's nothing wrong with it, I can imagine a situation where that word will be born in the language. So speakers of a language know which words actually occur in that language and which words actually do not, even though they may, they may be potential words. This means Unlike sentences, which are infinite in length, in principle, and so cannot be listed, the words of a language can be listed. They form a finite set, which consists of the vocabulary of that language. We've already understood that there is a notion of a possible but non-occurring word. Here are some more examples from English. There is a verb go, to go. You don't normally speak of a goer, a person who goes. There is a verb bake, you speak of a baker. There's a verb uh, do, you speak of a doer. But you don't normally speak of a goer. However, in a compound word, the word goer is quite acceptable. So we are not church goers, you can say in English. Hmm? You can speak of a school-going child, school-goers. So these are possible but non-occurring words. They appear in the language when we need them. When we don't need them, they're not there. So these are called accidental gaps in the lexicon. Another example of such a gap is the word stitched as an adjective. Nobody says, I'm wearing a stitched shirt because all shirts are stitched. But I can say this shirt is well stitched. Interestingly, the word tailored has an independent existence. A tailored shirt means not a ready-made shirt. But whether a shirt is ready-made or tailored, it is stitched. And so we don't talk about a stitched shirt. These are examples of the way we use language in the real world. And so they are very open to 
our needs and necessities in the real world. The system allows these words to exist, but we don't use them. More importantly, we can recognize that words have internal structure. As a speaker of a language, if I hear the word delimitations in English, I can see that it is made up of word parts. D, limit, ation, and s. So I can immediately see that this word has internal structure. Similarly, a speaker of Hindi, when they hear the word, when they hear the word asim or simit, can immediately see that these words are related to sima, limit, and asim is a prefix a which negates the word, so without limit, and simit, it is a suffix which gives the word an adjectival meaning. So, as speakers of a language, we know that the words in that language can have a complex structure. The parts of a word are called morphemes. Morphemes are parts of words. A morpheme can also be a word. There are words which are monomorphemic. For example, boy, cat, dog in English. We've spoken about accidental gaps in the lexicon, but now we've introduced the idea that words can have internal structure. They consist of morphemes which are put together in some way. It appears that you cannot put morphemes together in any which way. You have to put morphemes together according to some rules. And if you violate these rules of how to compose morphemes into a word, you get ill-formed words. These words, are, which cannot exist, are called systematic gaps in the lexicon. So, we have accidental gaps, words that can exist but do not because we don't need them, and we have systematic gaps in the lexicon, words which cannot possibly exist in a language. What are some examples of a systematic gap? We talked about delimitations and we said that the word delimitations has all these morphemes D, limit, Asian, and S. Now these four morphemes, if you mess with the order in which they are put together, you get impossible words. You cannot say limit D Asians. What does it even mean? Because D is always a prefix in English. So you cannot put it after the word limit. You cannot say delimits Asian, and we'll tell you why in a minute. So an impossible word is a word that violates the rules of composition for morphemes. The non-existence of an impossible word creates a systematic gap in the lexicon. Coming to morphemes themselves, morphemes have regular and predictable properties. For example, we can tell from the shape of a morpheme what the syntactic category of the word is likely to be. We've been talking about delimitation. You know that it is a noun, the delimitation of the rights of the population and so on, we can say. You find that most or all words which end in Asian in English are nouns. So, Asian is a noun ending. Vacation, cessation, rotation are all nouns in English. Similarly, we talked about simit in Hindi, simit, limited, which is an adjective. And you will see that it in Hindi makes adjectives. So, you have the words likhit, which is written, pathit, which is studied, chalit, which is current. All of them end in it. So a morpheme has properties which are recognizable. We recognize it in Hindi as a morpheme which signals that it is an adjective and Asian in English as a morpheme that signals that it is a noun. We can also, to some extent, therefore, 
predict the meaning of these words which end in Asian or in it. So if a word ends in Asian, we know that it is probably formed from a noun, limit, limitation, uh, fix, fixation. And the meaning of the Asian word is a function of the meaning of the base to which the affix attaches. Asian attaches to a verb, it forms a noun, the meaning of the noun is usually the act of the verb. Limit, limitation, the act of limiting, the limitation of civil rights by the government or the result of limiting. Limitation, this is a limitation of my civil rights or the property of limiting. These are the three broad meanings of Asian words and you can see that the word in Asian has a meaning which is the function of the base to which Asian attaches. Traditionally, the morpheme has also been said to be the minimal sign. It has been called the Saussurian sign. We said that the words are arbitrary. The words in a language are arbitrary. So what is called dog in English is called chien in French kutta in Hindi and so on. We've said this in another unit. But these are morphemes of the language and the traditional idea was that therefore the morpheme is the minimal linguistic sign. Recently a person called Mark Aronoff, a linguist, has contended that the morpheme is not a minimal sign. It is the word which is a minimal sign. And the reason he says this is that there are morphemes that have no meaning. Think of words like probable and possible in English. Are these words monomorphemic or are they multimorphemic? Do they consist of more than one morpheme? To answer this question, compare probable and possible with words like readable and washable. You will immediately see that the words readable and washable consist of two morphemes. Readable consists of read and able, washable consists of wash and able, and the meaning of readable and washable is derived from the meaning of read and wash. What, what can be read is readable, what can be washed is washable. Read and wash are verbs, readable and washable are adjectives. Now look back at probable and possible. And you see that probable and possible are also adjectives. So we said that suffixes determine word category. Asian means it's a noun. It means it's an adjective in Hindi and so on. And so here again we see that abl, sometimes pronounced ibl in English, usually means that, that the word in, in which this uh, morpheme occurs is an adjective. But the meaning of probable and possible cannot be split up into the meaning of pos and the meaning of able or the meaning of prob and the meaning of able. This is because pos and prob are not verbs in English and so they have no meaning. So now we have a situation where we know that these words consist of two morphemes. We can identify the morpheme because it signals that the word in which it occurs is an adjective and it also undergoes further suffixation. It can be suffixed with iti. So we have probability, possibility, we have readability, washability. So those words, the abl in all the four words behaves in a very regular way except that in words like possible and probable, because pos and prob have no meaning, we cannot say that the meaning of possible and probable is a function of the meaning of pos and prob. And therefore, we have morphemes like pos and prob, which are identifiable as morphemes, but which have no meaning. The word gravitates towards the sign. Traditionally, again, we have talked about free morphemes and bound morphemes. I say traditionally because unlike syntax, 
The study of words or morphology has a long tradition and a long history. And in this unit, we are rehearsing and recapitulating quite a few of the traditional notions of word structure. Although, as you have just seen, we have also challenged a traditional idea that the morpheme is the minimal sign. To come back to the point, traditionally, morphemes have been divided into free morphemes and bound morphemes. Free morphemes are words. They can stand on their own. Bound morphemes are affixes. You can have three kinds of affixes. Prefixes, which occur at the beginning of a word. Suffixes, that we have seen examples of, which occur at the end of the word. And infixes, which occur inside a word. There aren't too many infixes in English, but there are many languages which have infixes. Suffixes typically change the category of the word they attach to. We've already seen this. Take a verb like read or wash, add able to it, it becomes an adjective, add iti to that, and it becomes a noun again. So, read, readable, readability. But prefixes typically do not change the category of the word they attach to. So, tai is a verb, untai is also a verb. Another distinction between affixes is that of derivational affixes versus inflectional affixes. Derivational affixes are the kinds of affixes we've been looking at so far. These are affixes which change the category of a word. Inflectional affixes are grammatical affixes. They tell us whether a word is plural or singular if it's a noun whether a verb is past or present, if it's a verb. They tell us what a verb or an adjective agrees with in languages which have agreement. Agreement is an inflectional affix. Typically, inflections do not occur within derivations. We talked about the word delimitation, delimitations. And we said that delimitsation is not a word, is not a possible word. Why is it not a possible word? Because the affix which is spelt as S in English is typically an inflectional affix. It, it occurs on nouns as a plural affix, boy boys. It occurs on verbs as an, as an agreement affix. He limits, he reads, he limits. So, S is an inflectional affix. If you say limits Asian, you've got an inflection occurring inside a derivation. And normally, this is the traditional wisdom, normally this is not possible. However, there are, if you look into a variety of languages and how inflections behave in these languages, there are examples where inflectional affixes also are derivational affixes. Even in English, the past participle of a verb, now that is typically an inflectional affix, but that past participle behaves like an adjective. So these are not very, very strict notions. But in any case, given that inflections do not occur within derivations, broadly speaking, we can say that the lexicon is divided into levels or strata. You begin with morphemes. You put morphemes together into words. The way you put them into words is first you put all the derivational affixes onto a stem and then you start putting the inflectional affixes so that the inflections appear outside the derivations. But interestingly, even within derivation, we can identify two levels of affixes. That is the work done in the 70s, which, did, which identified this. To see this, we will take two suffixes in English, which are very similar, because they both attach to nouns to derive adjectives. These two suffixes are ness and iti. They both attach to adjectives. The resulting word is a noun. 
rigid rigidity rigid rigidness pure purity pureness lax laxity laxness and you can do the others for yourself luminous luminosity luminousness toxic toxicity toxicness so these affixes are very similar in what they do how they function in the language and yet there is evidence that iti is a level 1 affix ness is a level 2 affix we turn now to that evidence the evidence is that iti attaches to stems or bound morphemes ness attaches only to words it cannot attach to bound morphemes so so far we have seen that you can have a single stem which is a word to which either iti or ness can attach lax laxity laxness rigid rigidity rigidness but now look at words like paucity probity alacrity you can see that these are all nouns paucity means the lack of something or the probity is a quality of being honest alacrity is again a quality you can identify it but there are no words pos p a u c prob p r o b r o b or a l a c alac a l a c r to which it attaches this is the same problem we saw with probable and possible you can identify the able but this what able attaches to is a stem so similarly you can identify iti in these words and iti here has attached to a stem which is less than a word now interestingly you cannot form ness words with these stems so you don't have words in english like posness probness alacrness these are impossible words so it attaches to word stems ness cannot attach to word stems and the picture we have now of these kinds of suffixes is that there is a base which may be a stem that is less than a word it's just a bound morpheme a level 1 suffix like it can attach to it that derives a word at the level of the word a level 2 suffix can attach so level 2 suffixes attach outside level 1 suffixes and finally inflections attach i've shown you only the suffixes on the graphic but the same thing holds for prefixes as well the levels that we have talked about of et and ness have phonological and semantic correlates for example et causes stress shift and velar consonant softening ness does not cause either of these look at these words rigid stress is on the first syllable rigid rigidity rigidity stress is on the second syllable rigidness rigidness stress is again on the first syllable so rigid rigidness there is no alteration of stress. Rigid, rigidity, stress shifts. Look at these words now. Toxic, toxic, toxicity. Stress has shifted, toxicity. But toxic uh, has become toxicity. It's not toxicity it's toxic city compare it with toxicness it's not toxicness it's toxicness so the rules of stress shifting and velar softening that is the rule which changes cur to sir must apply after the level one suffixes attach and before level 2 suffixes attach to the word okay interestingly 
Iti is a Latinate suffix. Ness is not. And to some extent, we can attribute these behaviors, different behaviors of iti and ness to their origin. We find across the world's languages that depending on where a word comes into the language from, those words behave as a group somewhat differently. So in many of our languages, the Sanskrit origin words can be easily identified because they behave somewhat differently than the so-called native origin words, especially in the Dravidian languages. Iti words not only are more uh, idiosyncratic in phonology, they are also more idiosyncratic in their meaning. If you know the meaning of the base and you add ness to it, you are pretty sure what the word with the ness should mean. But we have evidence that if you add iti, iti to a word, its meaning is less compositional. And of course, this follows from the point that iti can be attached to words, uh, to stems which are not words, like in probity, paucity. And so, the meaning of those words is not compositional at all. Level ordering then is a very interesting hypothesis about the internal structure of the lexicon of a language. But it is not without its problems. One set of problems is called level ordering paradoxes. What is a paradox? When something happens which is opposite to what we predict should happen. So we have level 1 affixes and level 2 affixes and we don't expect level 2 affixes to attach inside level 1 affixes. When that happens, we have a level ordering paradox. Look at the word ungrammaticality. It's a very interesting word because it has grammar in it and yet this word presents us with a level ordering paradox ungrammaticality. What is the problem with the word? The word consists of un, grammatical and iti. What does it mean? The property of being ungrammatical. So we expect that you have a word ungrammatical to which iti should attach. Only then will the meaning be compositional. But un is a level 2 prefix and iti is a level 1 suffix. So when you try to combine the morphemes in this order, start with grammatical, well you can start with grammar, make it into grammatical if you like, then you add un, now you try to add iti, the rules of composition according to level ordering will not allow this. The rules of composition according to level ordering want you to make the word like the like this, make the word grammatical first, add grammaticality to it, add iti to it and make grammaticality and then add un to it to make it ungrammaticality. But this gives us the wrong order for the composition of the meaning of the morphemes. And that is why we say that this is a level ordering paradox. To summarize, speakers can distinguish actual or occurring words from accident, accidental gaps and systematic gaps in the lexicon. Words consist of morphemes that have recognizable syntactic properties but may not always be meaningful. The morpheme is not the minimal sign. Evidence from morphology, phonology and semantics suggests a level ordering of inflection and derivation and within derivation of two types of derivational affixes. But there are also problems with the level ordered lexicon. We have level ordering paradoxes. There is much more to be said about morphology and the structure of words and in the next unit we will look at what we now call morphosyntax. In the meanwhile, 
if you read the e-text, there is some more detail about the kinds of properties of morphemes that we have discussed today. Thank you very much.